All right. <laughs> How's everybody doing? Everybody, <laughs> we all got here. Okay. It's finally not raining. We navigated the potholes. Appreciate everybody being here. <laughs> it's great to see you all in person. I'm very excited to showcase and celebrate all of our entrepreneurs that are here tonight and the last seven months of hard work they put in in this program. I know you're going to hear from all of them on the progress that they've made, but they've done a really good job and there's been so many support from all of you. So we thank you. Um, I am Vanessa Scott. For those of you who haven't met me, I work here at Scripps and I'm very lucky to have this view all the time. Uh, I lead industry relations and innovations here at Scripps and I co-lead the Start Blue Accelerator program with my colleague, Karen Jensen, who's right there at Rady School of Management. Oops. <laughs> so Starkly was launched, God, I guess 2020, we launched the planning phase and 2021, we launched the first cohort. So it's still pretty new uh, and it's led um, by Scripps and Rady. So we've got all of the ocean climate research expertise, testing facilities combined with all the business expertise and innovation uh, um, training that Rady has to offer. And we really launched this to support early stage ocean focused startups. So um, you'll hear from many tonight, and they are all within kind of the blue economy landscape, and there are many different industry sectors within that, so I know you'll hear from all of it in a little bit. Uh, I also want to start off by recognizing our staff team. We're small but mighty. Um, so again, Karen Jensen, entrepreneurship advocate at Race School Management, who's been leading and supporting these types of programs for eight years now. Uh, Cannon Purdy, who's on my team here at Scripps, who helps dial in all of our entrepreneurs and startups to the regional innovation ecosystem. Chris Ward, our fierce leader for the mentorship program that is invaluable. Uh, John York, our lead instructor, who I hope is zooming in right now, uh, who led the business boot camp in the fall. And Jordan DiNardo, who hopefully is in here by now and not in the parking lot, who's helped with all the founders roundtables and coordinating a lot of the logistics. Also like to thank our supporters without whom we couldn't have had this program. So we thank you very much. Uh, also to our program partners, a lot of whom are here tonight, who have helped with a lot of uh, building the networks for our entrepreneurs and startups, providing different events and conferences, site visits to the Port of San Diego's Blue Economy Incubator. Um, we thank you for your partnership. And we want to thank our program advisors, some of who are here tonight as well, for their depth and breadth of expertise that have helped select our startups and also inform our program and curriculum. And last but definitely not least, the mentors. We really thank you guys for the countless hours of invaluable time and support and, and advice that you've given our uh, startups and entrepreneurs of the last seven months. So thank you all so much. We really appreciate it. And uh, yeah, I know many of you are here right now as well. So just a, a few numbers from Start Blue. We've only had two cohorts, but we've supported 12 startups um, who have raised collectively over $8.3 million, many of whom have been female founders. Uh, and then we also had CalWave in the last cohort, was the first wave energy um, pilot here right off our Scripps Pier. Um, and they're going off to PacWave in Oregon next year. So very exciting achievements. And just a quick snapshot of kind of the agenda for tonight, you'll hear from each team giving a five minute pitch and then they will give five minutes for Q&A from the audience. So get your questions ready. There will also be an audience choice award. So there'll be a QR code at the end where you can vote through an app uh, on your favorite startup to win a little cash prize. And then we'll break and have networking. So I encourage you, our startups will all have tables outside. Some will even show some of their prototypes. So definitely meet our entrepreneurs ask questions. We really want you guys to all um, help each other out tonight and make new new connections. And with that, I will introduce our guest speaker tonight, Dr. Jack Gilbert, who is our Deputy Director of Research, Associate Vice Chancellor, sorry for the typo, of Marine Science. <laughs> Chancellor, <laughs> so much cooler. Uh, who's gonna share more about his entrepreneurship experience and kind of a little bit on the blue economy and the opportunities in there. Thank you, Vanessa. All right, so it's um it's it's a great pleasure to be here. I've I've only been at SIO for four years. I'm strangely jointly appointed between pediatrics up in health sciences and Scripps Institution of Oceanography, which makes me the world's first pediatric oceanographer or oceanographic pediatrician. But the the, the central premise of that is um, I like to innovate across multiple sectors. And I, I, I think we have a lot of people in the room here and a lot of young innovators in the room 
that are thinking about how they can um, not just focus on how to innovate in one particular area, but what implications their work could have for multiple areas. And so I wanted to start just by highlighting some of the stuff that we've done and how important it's been to cross pollinate between different systems. So um, we started uh, about four years ago, mapping human brains um, up in health sciences and mapping those human brains back to the kinds of microbiology that was going on inside the intestine. And we particularly focused on trying to understand different brain regions that were associated with depression and looking at the signals of depression in the brain and seeing if it correlated with any particular microorganisms which might have been present in the intestines of those people. We found particular bacteroides species which were negatively associated with symptoms of depression. We took these organisms, we ran them through a battery of tests and found out that these bugs were pretty good at rescuing animals from symptoms of depression and also at having an inhibitory effect against inflammation in the body. And we've recently pushed this through um, with a collaboration across multiple sectors at um, UCSD to demonstrate that these bacteria can be used as probiotics as effective as ketamine in reducing depression symptoms. So taking probiotic organisms that we identify in people and introducing them into people that can have real benefit. This is a uh, now being spun out into a company called Holobiome, um, which is uh, basically providing new probiotic formulations coming from human fecal matter. So you can really can get gold from poop. Um, and another example is us taking a long running program that we did uh, starting out of a, um, uh, an assessment to do citizen science programs where we basically asked every single person in a room if we could have a poop sample and analyze that poop and use that information to build what became the American Gut Database, which allows us to compare our microbiomes to everybody else, about 30 to 40,000 of our fellow citizens. And using this information, we were able to uncover the microbial chemistry inside our bodies that helped every aspect of our life from how we process drugs um, to um, how we manage adiposity of neurobehavioral disorders, cardiometabolic disease, et cetera. But we recently found out that our data from one time point, one snapshot sample from every single person in this database was missing an element, time. So we found out that we actually needed to collect more than 20 different samples, consecutive poop samples, if you will, from every single person over time in order to get a really fundamentally statistically robust snapshot of what their microbiome was and how we could use that information. This is because, um, and this is cut off, so that should say high dimensional, not high dimensio null. Um, but this is because the microbiome is a horrible data set to deal with, right? It's incredibly high dimensional. Um, just like genetics, but it's also incredibly dynamic, like your insulin or blood pressure. It changes regularly. And when you're trying to look for robust metrics in a population, things that change regularly are not ideal because they fluctuate, right? So to capture this, we really needed to start studying population sizes of people that are incredibly big, like huge study sections, and then collect large numbers of samples. And that became incredibly expensive. That, that um, frequent sampling was our worst thing. Finally, people don't want to sample their poop every day. We don't know why. So we built a, um, another company called Biomsense and have spun out the world's first automated microbiology lab that uh, can sit in your bathroom. It's a battery powered system that replaces an entire molecular laboratory, a shipping operation and a preservation system into one box that sits next to your toilet. You enter in your pin code in the top and you drop your poop sample in there with a piece of used toilet tissue. As you can understand, a lot of my life is involved in poop. Um, I get very used to it, other people are not. I apologize for that, Google. All right, so the, these examples are where we took research from the, from the bench and we really translated it out into the bedside. And I'm trying to see how we can use this kind of innovator to take that kind of medical clinical innovation and put it back into um, the marine, the blue sciences, if you will. And so uh, when, I, when I came here, I was not particularly well versed in the blue economy and Vanessa has been teaching me um, about these processes and helping me to understand how we can, again, bridge that clinical innovation angle, that clinical business mindset and push it um, and create niches in this blue economy. So the blue economy uh, is the sustainable use of ocean resources for economic growth, improved livelihoods and jobs and ocean ecosystem health. 
I could switch out words there and I'd have the clinical economy as well, right? And uh, so th these are really parallel organizations. We currently have an ocean economy output valued around $2.5 trillion. The biggest ocean-based industries uh, are touting around 1.1 trillion with marine tourism, which is vital if you wanna keep our ecosystems looking healthy. Um, 595 billion for marine high technology, a lot of which uh, is cross-pollinated with uh, NASA activities, uh, looking at space as a, as a new frontier and building out the properties for ocean travel as well, and maritime transport services. In fact, uh, UCSD and SIO particularly is trying to innovate in that area with the world's first zero carbon ship. We're running a, a new program to build and develop um, the world's first hydrogen powered vessel which will be the clean operations for our research properties. The American blue economy supports around 2.5 or 3.3 million jobs and contributes approximately a third of a trillion dollars to the national gross domestic product in 2018. And this again is spread out over that tourism and recreation, national defense and public administration, which is obviously vital and which SIO plays a huge role in. Offshore minerals um, and mining operations, transport and warehousing, and um, obviously commercial fishing and aquaculture. In San Diego, especially, we're very, very interested in aquaculture. After years of, um, of exploitation, we're looking at ways of providing sustainable systems because the protein in the ocean is an incredibly valuable resource which we can access, but only if we can do it in a sustainable way. The San Diego Blue Economy specifically um, has around uh, 5,000 maritime water and blue tech companies. Um, there are over 100,000 jobs, um, and these are focused around tourism and recreation, that coastal ocean tourism, offshore wind and energy processes, uh, green technologies that will allow us to reduce our carbon burden, the resources such as, again, food, fisheries, the aquaculture industry, and interestingly, desalination, which is incredibly valuable for the Californian economy. And we have a number of pilot scale studies dotted around the uh, around the state, which are proving to be incredibly valuable in helping us to access new water resources. And then risk avoidance. We have three different centers here um, at SIO that are focused explicitly at providing risk management properties for organizations associated with climate. Um, in fact, uh, if you've heard of ocean rivers, uh, ocean rivers, climate, atmospheric rivers, um, we have an entire, we have the, the people that basically wrote the textbook, literally wrote the textbook on atmospheric rivers here. And they, they are packaging up their processes, um, thanks to Vanessa and her team, to, to farm those operations out to the broader economy uh, it, across all countries, um, including the Middle East, uh, Australia, very dry, arid regions, but even Antarctica, where the atmospheric rivers are playing a very big role in eroding the ice sheets. So science-informed decision-making, those atmospheric rivers and, and reservoir management is a key area that we are focused on explicitly. And the new technology for conservation, using robotics and um, uh, autonomous vehicle surveys that are deployed from one location to do continuous monitoring at scale has become incredibly valuable for us as we innovate in, in, in new robotic platforms. But we're also looking at biological resources. How can we use um, our aquaculture systems to create new uh, carbon, uh, so new carbohydrate sources that can be important in driving nutritional value in um, new food substrates. And then drug development. We, we literally put little gelatinous blobs out in the ocean across the entire system, and we discover new chemistries every single day. These are immensely valuable in helping us to tap into that chemical reservoir. And then uh, maintaining sea level temperature, acidity, and amount of oxygen through um, buoys that are spaced around the, around the country and around the world in a, in a grid network that requires data infrastructure that requires substantial innovation in cloud computing and spaces. So it touches virtually every aspect of where we are. Um, I'm incredibly excited um, to see innovation being put at the forefront of SIO's uh, portfolio. I think this is uh, um, going to be a leading enterprise as we move into a more applied science economy where, where we identify every single one of our research endeavors as having a real impact upon what we want to do as scientists um, upon the global economy and upon people. I always challenge every single one of my graduate students and postdocs and people at all levels 
to come up with an elevator pitch about their research and what it means to them and what it means to the people that they love and care about in their communities. And if you can do that, if you can see uh, the, the process from basic research to applied research, it makes you a better scientist. And in my mind, it also opens up the avenues for those science, industry, and academic partnerships, which will really drive the global economy forward. So welcome, and I'm really excited for you all to be here. And I do have to run, I apologize, more things to do. <laughs> Thank you. All right, well, I think Jack set the stage well for all the different kinds of technologies and solutions we're gonna to see tonight. And with that, I'd love to introduce our first entrepreneur, Babak Bahari, wherever there you are, uh, to talk more about his startup, Aris Photonic. Okay. Oh, the voice is good. No, it was good now. Okay. Hello, everyone. My name is Bobak Fari from Aras Photonic Startup Company. In our startup, we are working on developing LiDAR systems for monitoring different objects in the ocean, underwater, and above the water. So, in ocean, we are facing with different challenges such as oil spill, trashes, monitoring coastal lines, and so on. For example, chemicals and oil can leak and enter into the water and enter into the uh, food chain and kill different stream ocean species, make water and uh, food unsafe for human and animals, and eventually ruin our ecosystem. Currently, we are spending more than $90 billion for cleaning ocean and more than $30 billion for protecting our ecosystem. And these numbers are growing fast every year. It would be great if you could have some monitoring technique that can monitor these problems and detect them before they become huge disaster. Current uh, monitoring solutions are based on using sonar waves, radio waves, satellites, uh, visual cameras, and human eyes, which are very slow, expensive, and uh, sometimes they are very inefficient. However, recently due to advancement of LiDAR technology, it's becoming a popular solution of monitoring because it is very fast, reliable, it is useful for even invisible objects like chemicals, and potentially it can be inexpensive. Uh, these are the companies that are working on a Blue Tech LiDAR, and their product is something similar to this camera that is attached to this drone, which is very bulky, expensive, and the power consumption is very high, as well as the maintenance cost. Uh, but the main and important thing that we should notice here is none of these companies design or manufacture LiDAR. Basically, what they do, they take the current existing solution in LiDAR for autonomous vehicle, bring it into the ocean, and try to modify it and use it for uh, a water sensing. As a result, you see that with red color in this table. Uh, recently, we developed a new type of laser system that is very compact. As you see here, the actual picture of the device. It is very fast and expensive, and it is based on a novel physics and technology that uh, simplifies the design by removing redundant optical and mechanical components. As a result, the lifetime is longer and the maintenance cost is lower. Importantly, it is configured for any customer use case uh, by tuning angle and wavelengths, both of them at the same time. For this work, we got new tractions. We published uh, several uh, patents and created the top tier journals. It was selected as physical top 10 breakthrough in 2017 for scientific side, and it was highlighted for by NSF for technological side. We got Triton Innovation Challenge Award, which is a prestigious competition at UCSD. And recently, we found a, a, a strategic investor and manufacturing partner that is helping us to develop the first prototype of the LiDAR system. Uh, once we have these LiDAR systems, we can distribute it in the ocean and form a grid of network that are communicating with each other. And depending on the machine learning algorithm that we feed to this LiDAR network, it can monitor different objects. It can be tuned, for example, to monitor oil spill, use the use as an underwater 3D navigator, and monitor any sort of changes in the uh, ecosystem. Or it can be mounted on uh, drones because it is very lightweight and deployed to far distances for some particular application that is needed. 
Uh, currently, my mental remediation market size uh, colliders are more than $100 billion, and it is expected to be more than uh, $200 billion by 2030. So it's a huge market. And the key customers in this market for LiDAR systems are oil companies, maritime and military, fishing and agriculture, offshore energy, port operators, and sea guards, shipping and logistic companies. So far, we could uh, successfully establish the foundation of this uh, laser system. Uh, right now, we are at the step of developing the first product demo. And we are planning to raise more funding and ramp up our production over three different phases, as you see in this graph, and eventually sell LiDARs to existing uh, blue tech uh, solutions. This is our journey uh, in Star Blue. Since we joined to this program, uh, we had some successful customer discoveries uh, in San Diego Fire Department and Interocean System Company for oil steel detectors. We filed uh, three uh, grants, uh, two SPR and one non SPR. And for the remaining of this year, we are planning to raise more funding and connect with potential customers. And of course, definitely, if anyone in the, cost in the audiences can help us for these two purposes, we will appreciate it. Uh, currently, we have four people plus two faculty members uh, that are advising and pre providing some resources to us, limited resources. And we are working on different aspects of these uh, LiDAR systems. And finally, I would like to thank the staff members uh, and my mentor, Chris Ryan, who helped us a lot uh, by advising at different stages of this program. Thank you. Thanks, Babak. Is there any, uh, we have about five minutes for questions and discussion. Any questions from the audience? Well, I, I got one to start it off. Um, I, I noticed that your LiDAR, it's really small. It's a basically LiDAR on a chip. Um, that's going to collect a lot of data, isn't it? Yes. And and how are you going to manage and store and process all that data? So uh, for some short distances, it can uh, connect using wire to a station or some, uh, but for some big uh, size of LiDAR network, uh, wiring actually is kind of messy. We can uh, man make it to communicate with each other using laser. Mm -hmm. And then eventually they send data outside of the water for to a data center and collect there. And that's a place that we run machine learning algorithm because LiDAR by itself just sends light and receives the back scattering of the mm -hmm. light. It doesn't do anything. The rest of detect the training that LiDAR system to detect something, for example, oil spill or barriers for underwater navigation, mm -hmm. everything is done in that service. For on uh, for AUV on the uh, those vehicles in the water that can actually be inside that machine because it's going inside the water mm -hmm. so we don't have access to the data center so we can have two different things inside the device and for big network out of the out of that area that we are doing mining yeah. and, and how how are you going to business model that do you have a, some thoughts about how you're going to you know sell the system and yeah. So uh, at first, I said we are going to develop the product demo yeah. and try to sell it as a single uh, LiDAR system. And I showed the interocean inter inter system company, they are yeah. interested on using these LiDAR systems as an oil spill detector. And for the first stage, we are thinking about selling it as a single component. But for big dream, basically, we are thinking about uh, basically using these LiDAR systems for some, uh, let's say security or some big shipping companies. Mm -hmm. uh, so, um, Very good. Yeah. Um, any, any other questions from the audience? Tom? So as long as it's in QE does for the maritime environment or could it work with other industries like automotive or aero kind of things? Yeah, so the good thing about our technology is that it differs from the current existing LiDAR system is we are using a laser uh, module. The, Core of the heart of the LiDAR system is the laser module. That is uh, scalable. It can scale the wavelengths. When you are in the land for autonomous vehicle or whatever, we are using uh, certain frequencies. And when we are inside the ocean, we are using another frequency because of the absorption. Current LiDAR technology is an autonomous vehicle and we cannot use it for ocean, but our system is scalable. We can tune it to work inside the water and when it comes out of the water, it can switch and tune the variables. So this is the main benefit of our system. Yeah, Nick? What's the range underwater, do you think? 
So the range in the water because of that absorption issue is in the less than 100 meter, which is uh, each meter is three to three. So the typical value that people right now operate is 10 meter or less, more or less in this range. So we are basically using the same light, which is blue or green color. But the thing is behind that, since the absorption is high and the environment is noisy, we are using some machine learning algorithm to extract this actual signal out of those noises. So the range should be in the range of 100 meter more or less. In the we still don't have the product demo to test, but it should be in that range. I think we got time for one more, maybe. Other questions for Babar? Yeah, Kenan. What inspired you to get into LiDAR technology? What get into? What inspired you to get into okay. LiDAR? Okay, so, um, so basically this started from uh, my research during PhD. And uh, at that time, the goal was not to make LiDAR. The goal was, my, my, my background is working on laser. And then eventually I just uh, spin up to the LiDAR because it has, LiDAR or radar also is radio wave or a plane, but LiDAR is with a shorter resonance for and uses light. Uh, it has lots of technology. Uh, it's not only just laser, it has electronic, it has computer science. So for me, it's very interesting. So I just, I just worked on that. All right, well, thank you, Baba. Sure. All right, excellent. Next up is Zach Hooker with Ocean Soteria. Good evening, everyone. My name is Zach Hooker, and our company's name is Ocean Soteria. Uh, our mission is to help revitalize our coastal kelp forests and climate vitality by re engineering ocean balance. So I grew up scaling down cliffs uh, up in Northern California, uh, trying to get to coveted abalone diving spots up near Mendocino. Uh, we dive all day and then celebrate our catch each night with a cook-off and a family gathering. Uh, and we notice a major increase in a certain species of purple urchin uh, in our usual spots. And then the abalone, the recreational abalone diving shut down in 2017 because of the, declin uh, the de declination of the kelp forest. So the problem was the purple urchins. So we noticed this major increase and these particular urchins have been known as zombie urchins as they're able to live up to 70 years and have almost hollow shells with no uni inside and can smell kelp from almost 500 yards away. Uh, so they're devastating kelp forests and eating almost every leaf in the area. So the current status quo of handling this problem has been commercial divers tackling it with hammers, subsea, uh, and hammering these urchin as best as they can, which is like putting out a wildfire with a squirt gun. So you could see this relationship between kelp and urchin around 2015, an explosion in the purple urchin and a declination in the kelp forest. So how can technology help? Well, our solution is a autonomous subsea floor crawler with capabilities to identify and cull these zombie purple sea urchin in the most delicate and least invasive way possible in order to help population control of the urchin as well as boost kelp reforestation. We're also developing probabilistic target search algorithms using model predictive control in our lab in order to find the best population densities to tackle this urchin problem. We did an evaluation of the market size and found that the total available market worldwide for kelp forest industries is around $20 billion. We noticed uh, the local market uh, for conservancies utilizing carbon credits could use our service as a subscription for kelp reforestation and we could make revenue on a per acre basis. So our critical path in this venture is to target 60,000 purple urchin 
uh, by this year with a targeted revenue of $100,000 and three AUVs in operation with the mission to scale up in four years to 200 AUVs with a 12 million sea urchin culling target and a $20 million revenue. When you look at the competition, really there isn't any that are able to hit the same addressable locations, have autonomy, address the environmental and big data needs, as well as have a cost and time savings. So we've got a lot of local support from a lot of conservancies that are directly involved in this issue, uh, namely kelp reforestation, including Nora Eddy with the Nature Conservancy, who likes our idea of in situ culling of the urchin. We've spoke with Department of Fish and Wildlife and some scientists that are partnered with that organization, and they're willing to help as much as they can. And we've also had a discussion with Tom Ford with the Bay Foundation who's a world leader on kelp reforestation, who says they're willing to let our, us use their uh, site in Santa Monica as a pilot test site for our project and give us some figures on what the current cost for them is to handle this urgent problem at their site. Our team is a group of roboticist experts with a deep passion for our ocean, uh, namely Professor Tom Buley and I, uh, who is the director of the Contextual Robotics Institute over at the Cyber Physical Lab Group at UCSD. Uh, we're currently located in the Franklin Antonio building on the third floor, uh, developing uh, this prototype. And we are partnered with uh, three other lab groups inside our uh, collaborative lab area, um, specializing in soft robotics as well. So we hope to leverage uh, today's technology uh, in order to uh, help with this urchin population management problem. So our ask is to help us raise $150,000 uh, so that we can help bring back kelp forests and boost biodiversity along our California coastlines. So we intend to use the, uh, the funding um, to help our project pilot test site with the Bay Foundation and uh, possibly work out a Scripps test site with uh, a Scripps pilot test site as well. Uh, I'd like to give a special thanks to Neil Treneman, who has been uh, so helpful along the way of our journey. Uh, great mentor sitting in the back over there. And then as well as uh, Jim Harvey and uh, Steve uh, Cranford, who's been great mentors, and as well as the Start Blue team, who's made this program and this opportunity possible. So thank you very much. And uh, any questions? Any questions for Zach? Yeah. Okay. Interested in the urchin here, and I'm curious as to how it works. Yeah, of course. So it's a uh, subsea crawler style AUV, and so it uses a machine learning capability in order to identify a purple urchin using uh, basically the shape outline. Uh, so it's got a, a subsea camera, and it essentially crawls over and uses a linear actuator in order to puncture a hole uh, in the urchin. So it screws a hole into the urchin and, uh, and kind of moves in a uh, pathway like sweeping, uh, kind of like a, a Roomba. Yeah, I got a, quite a follow up question. How, how many does it, does it do a bunch like quickly or does it kind of find one, boom, find one, boom? For it? Yeah, since the prototype is still in development, it's kind of like one one per every 10 seconds is kind of our goal in order to. And we've looked at uh, attaching multiple linear actuators in a row, kind of like sharks with rows of teeth, uh, in order to kind of um, go through kind of like the laser weeders using in agriculture, kind of do multiple uh, at once. But so right now our goal is one every 10 seconds in, in the line. Yeah, of course. So uh, if we look here with three AUVs operating uh, 20 hours a day, 365, uh, with a 60,000 sea urchin culling rate, um, that's two acres. So two acres in a year with three AUVs is our projection. Yeah, absolutely. So we're, we're starting with a subsea floor crawler, kind of like a tank in order to tackle the low hanging fruit. And then once we continue to develop other prototype devices and uh, we've, we've looked at special kind of crawlers that 
um, use these fins almost like a, if you could just imagine a curve and six legs with these curves so they can handle more uh, rough topography. So, but we're going for the low hanging fruit first. And that is part of the um, probabilistic search algorithms that we're developing are to uh, identify those low hanging fruit areas to start as soon as possible. Yeah, thank you. Are they uh, tethered or what is the power? Right, so the idea is uh, to be completely autonomous. So we're, we're currently working on a remote version, um, but the power source, we've actually been talking with uh, CalWAVE uh, and some other organizations that use wave propagation uh, for energy generation. And so the full system would have a surface vehicle, AUV, uh, that would uh, eventually dock uh, so we're also talking with a couple companies in Michigan and Canada that have just proved a uh, uh, underwater subsea dock that goes through uh, all seasons, even when it freezes over, and they're looking for additional projects. So they kind of have like a docking cage that you can uh, park and then re regenerate the battery and then go out. So that's the goal. Yeah, good question. We're, we're still figuring out exactly. I think it's about like a day um, for them, uh, the culling uh, to be complete. But as far as the, um, the biomass, they're made out of calcium bicarbonate shells. And so uh, Nora Eddy with the Nature Conservancy appreciated our idea of in situ culling um, because the uh, ocean acidification problem uh, the calcium bicarbonate would actually offset ocean acidification, which is a, a big toll on coral reefs and such. And we're actually also developing um, a way, since they're using the spines in biomedical as bone uh, situs, we're, we're hoping that we might be able to like package them together, kind of like toothpicks and, and, uh, and utilize every piece. But for now, just in situ calling. Yeah, of course. So we're looking uh, at a subscription service uh, with uh, conservancies. So to charge uh, for both the kelp reforestation and the kelp monitoring posts. So we're, we're trying to kind of dial in, but it'd be a subs subscription service uh, in order to uh, generate revenue at first. And then also carbon credits with uh, grants and uh, that's okay. So I got time for one more. Right. Maybe repeat the question. Yeah, I think, uh, if I'm, did you ask how are we going to monitor the kelp growth after? Right. Yeah. So, so that would, that is definitely going to take time in order to uh, ensure that the credits are reliable. Um, but I think spectral density uh, cameras that would uh, basically make passes over these areas and then also physical commercial divers. Um, so the goal is to leave one urchin uh, per square meter uh, and then monitor kelp root growth afterwards. So we're, we're talking with a few companies uh, in order to discover the monitoring system afterwards. But, so I think that would be for the reliability of the carbon credits. Great. Thanks, Zach. All right. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Zach. Next up, we have Coil Reef with Roger Benham, Noah Brown, and Ben Smith. We're Coil Reef, and we first off want to thank Star Blue for um, giving us this opportunity to present today. The ocean provides us with countless resources, from food to recreation. However, as our population grows and our dependence on the ocean increases, we're putting unprecedented pressure on our fragile ecosystems. Climate change is damaging oceans, causing coral reefs and beaches to erode. Rising sea levels, temperatures, and acidification leads to the risks of our ocean. Coral reef is a multi-use product we think can be a solution to these issues. Coral reef can be a solution to habitat restoration, beach erosion mitigation, along with enhancing the aquaculture and research industries. 
what is coil reef? Coil reef is a removable and low cost artificial reef system for marine habitat formation and restoration. It's also uh, uh, for energy, uh, wave energy mitigation uh, or dissipation to address beach erosion issues. Also, it is a substrate for marine growth, including aquaculture and marine research applications. It is made of titanium, roll form titanium. Uh, why titanium? It has a nil corrosion rate in seawater. Also, titanium is 100% biocompatible. It's what we use for implants in our bodies. Uh, we can make a structure of any diameter or length, so we can make miles or acres of this structure. Uh, the, uh, it is a coil-shaped structure which maximizes, the, with the, the strip material, maximizes a surface area. And that's our secret sauce. Uh, surface area is what enables the solution to addressing the problems uh, that this uh, will be applied to solve. Uh, titanium sounds expensive, but we can show it is the most cost-effective approach. Um, our ultimate goal is to install large artificial reef systems, but initially we are focused on two products that we can manufacture now. Uh, one is a marine aquaculture substrate. The second is a worldwide standardized test cell. This would be used to compare and evaluate what will grow in light of changing ocean conditions. All right, so our two current marketable products fit into two multi-billion dollar industries, including aquaculture, which is valued at $290 billion and ocean monitoring research, which is expected to reach $44 billion by 2030. This is some of our competition right here. Um, a lot of artificial reefs currently contain cement and concrete and research has shown that Portland cement and most concretes, sorry, there we go, um, leach chemicals into the water around them and negatively affect the habitability of the surrounding ecosystems. And also most artificial reef companies um, deploy reefs that are not easily removable. And that is the key feature of our technology. Aside from avoiding major costs for removal, this feature also makes us an excellent candidate for artificial reef zoning research. So our recent traction includes SBR grants. We applied for two, one for the aquaculture substrate and the second for the worldwide test cell. Um, we placed a coil at Cal Poly Pier and have fund funded undergraduate research for biocompatibility, um, bio growth and wave energy dissipation. Um, we now have our first customer, French Hermit um, Oyster Farm, who's now installing a coil in the Gulf of Mexico. And as of last week, we are currently semifinalists in the Trident Innovation Challenge. Going into Start Blue, we had a finished product, but we didn't know how to market it. Um, Start Blue gained us, gave us business expertise and helped us identify our target market. Um, they've opened their eyes to numerous amounts of funding and helped us um, grow our network. We are seeking financial support. Uh, our needs are modest. Uh, we need shop space. Uh, you can see uh, uh, to the bottom left, that is how we receive our material. And again, it's part of our secret sauce because that one pallet load is miles or acres of reef or thousands of our, uh, our substrate or pro and products. Uh, to the right of that is our existing roll machine, roll forming machine. We need to uh, make improvements on that. Uh, our second ask, is we need to uh, make a key hire. We are engineers and scientists. Uh, we belong in the shop. Uh, so we need help with the sales marketing, growth, uh, grants proposal writing, research, uh, uh, various applications. But we believe we can be profitable in three years with the, the two products. I would just like to introduce our team as of now. Um, we have our founder, Roger Benham. He's also an, a professor at Cal Poly University. Then Noah Brown, he's an undergraduate oceanic and atmospheric sciences major at UCSD. And then myself, Ben Smith, an undergraduate environmental systems major at UCSD. And I would also like to thank our mentors from Start Blue, 
Greg Peters, Nick Herring, and Amy Zimmerfaust for their amazing help throughout this journey. They've been awesome. Thank you for your time. And if you would like to contact us, we put up an email um, and our website and phone number, but that'll all be outside on our booth. Thank you. <laughs>
Do you have any sense for you know, how much can you sell this thing for in terms of our customer? Right? And a uh, second question as well. How do you guys get connected? I'm just curious because how far you need to get people. Yeah. So we will charge what the market will bear. And I think that's true for your iPhone. Uh, so uh, the material is, uh, we have a booth, please come visit us. You can get a sense of the weight. So I, on our SBIR application, we prov provided that. I have it, uh, I, can, uh, I could read it to you, but there's considerable markup potential because I know I'm, I, I'm talking too much, but so we're selling this product saying, this is a higher initial investment, but it's going to last forever or, you know, in, for so long versus, yeah, you make it out of a cheaper material, you're going to pay less up front. So that's our sales. And uh, how do you, you tell that story? Yeah, I, I can. So um, I work at a lab at Scripps, the Coastal Processes Group. Um, and so one of my coworkers, is somehow related to Roger. My my niece's husband. Yeah, and so I was working there. I'm an, <laughs> very, yeah, very crazy, but I'm a third year, so I've been working in the lab for a year. Um, he gave me Roger's contacts, and I was thinking about it. I'm like, do I want to work with him by myself? So I wrangled Ben into this. <laughs> and so uh, it's been history ever since we applied to this program, and it's been pretty successful so far. Thank you guys. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you guys. And yeah, just a reminder, everyone's going to have a booth outside and these guys brought one of their coils. So definitely check it out afterwards. Next up, we have Octopus Seaweed Garden with Natalie Zevesh and Connor Elliott. <laughs> Right. Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Connor. I'm presenting with my co-founder, Natalie, today. Um, before we get started into our company and who we are, I just wanted to talk a little bit about our journey and how we got here. Natalie and I um, met initially in the lab. We were lab partners, kind of bonded over our love for seaweed. And from there, we saw the opportunity to apply for Start Blue and jumped on it. Here we are today. So we're Octopus Garden. Um, we're an aquaculture technology company focusing on expanding the seaweed growing industry. Um, and we'll do that using artificial upwelling um, to allow farms to relocate offshore and provide coastal uh, support, um, and then increase yield to meet a growing demand for seaweed and spur growth within the industry. So to answer the why of why we think our Technology is uh, important. We wanted to address the problem that we're trying to solve. So today in the current aquaculture industry, especially for seaweed, you see a lot of issues. Most of it occurs near shore, which can interfere with commercial activity, tourism, um, other things like that. And then in other places, especially in Southeast Asia, you see tidal basins kind of cleared out um, for aquaculture use, whether that be mangrove or coral reefs. Um, the destruction of environments is never good. So moving on from those problems, our solution has two parts to it. The technology-based system that will allow and um, uh, yeah, provide upwelling. Um, and then at the top of the water column is a grid-like uh, structure to provide support for seaweed to grow on. Um, and that should theoretically be vertically mobile within the, within the water column that it's placed in. Um, as the seaweed grows. So just to jump off of what Natalie just said, this is not um, an official render, but it kind of helps visualize what we're talking about here. Um, that nutrient dense water that sits lower in the ocean would be pushed up towards the surface where the sunlight allows the seaweed to grow. Um, that seaweed grows sucking in those nutrients, creating the viable products. So for ocean impact, uh, we kind of, focus toward all six of these goals, um, but most notably sustainable ocean resources and habitat restoration. Seaweed is a super unique crop to grow um, because you don't need to add any fertilizers or anything into the water. It instead, as a photosynthesizing organism, um, draws out carbon and fixes local nitrogen levels, so actually helps clean the habitat instead of having a bunch of extra things added into the water. 
Um, and it also kind of creates its own little ecosystem, um, providing habitat for juvenile fish and invertebrate species too. So just thinking about the industry that we're jumping into, I'm sure a lot of you are already aware, um, seaweed and aquaculture is generating a lot of media interest and hype recently. It can be used for a ton of things, whether it be food, people call it a superfood, can be used for biofuels, bioplastics, animal feed. Um, seaweed has a wide range of uses based on the species. Um, so I think that that really makes our industry exciting. And these are just some numbers to back up those headlines. Um, seaweed aquaculture was evaluated in 2020 to have a $14 billion market value and a compound annual growth rate of 12%. So it's a pretty valuable industry to be a part of right now. So just thinking about where we started and where we're hoping to go, um, through the Start Blue course, we learned so much about business from John York. Um, it was amazing, especially as marine biology majors, we had no idea what we were doing, at first at least, um, still have a while to go. But anyways, um, we established an LLC. Um, like our other team here, we are semi-finalists for the Triton Innovation Challenge. And right now we're currently designing and building our um, prototype. And then from there, we're really excited to jump into more strategic partnerships and move forward with our company. Here's a quick competition analysis. Um, the logos of the companies that we looked at are across the top, and then how we evaluated ourselves is to the left. Um, we really, we're one of the only companies that we've found so far in the market who are creating upwelling technology and pairing it with a sort of aquaculture. So that's, that's the main takeaway from this group. Yeah, so for our ask today, um, we're always asking for prototype funding. Um, as you can see, Natalie has to be a seaweed farmer to help fund our progress here. Um, we're also always looking for more industry connections or anyone's expertise. We'd love to hear from anyone about absolutely anything. Um, and just to end, thank you so much um, to our mentors first, Nick Ainsley and Christopher Coyle, who hopefully are tuning in right now virtually. Um, and they've they've met with us practically every week since October. So they've they've provided a lot of support to us. And then of course the Start Blue Accelerator program. Um, Connor and I, as we've said, we're just marine bio majors back in October, and this has provided us a lot of support with the business side of things. So thank you. Thank you. So questions for like this garden team? Yes. Yeah. So over the summer, I had the opportunity to work in an agriculture lab in Newport, Oregon, and I learned about multi-trophic agriculture, and that this just ties into what you're saying about the uh, production of nitrogen levels. Have you ever thought mm -hmm. of expanding to include multi-trophic agriculture practices into your work? Yeah, definitely. Um, right now we're just focused on getting on our feet with with seaweed, but I think establishing like an IMTF would be a really great place to jump forward from in the future. Um, it's just it's amazing that all of these different species do better when they're farmed together. So I think I think we'll definitely look into doing that. Awesome. How do you power upload? Yeah, so we've thought of a few major iterations as we've moved through our prototyping phase. Currently, what we're resting on um, is basically a pump that descends down into the ocean where that nutrient-dense water is. That pump would bring that water through a pipe up to the surface. And kind of just like drip irrigation, that water would be slowly distributed among the surface where the seaweed is growing. Mm -hmm. By, so um, that is one issue that we're kind of running into and needs to be worked on more, but solar energy is definitely um, an option for us. There's also the Ocean Motion uh, company that was in the first cohort here. Um, so we do have options for energy generation, but it would need to be localized. Speaking of energy, um, you know, one of the biggest things going right now in the blue tech world, scheme of things, is, is offshore wind, somebody alluded to earlier. Is there any connection between what you guys are doing and and the offshore wind. Yeah, I think that that could be a really valuable partnership for both us and offshore wind companies, um, especially kind of to have like a an ecosystem 
like I don't know offshore wind I think has um received criticism for like pollution that it might have especially like auditory pollution um wherever the farms are located and I think if you added seaweed or aquaculture to that it could provide um like ecosystem support obviously and then maybe even like an auditory buffer so that there's not as much pollution being cast out into the open ocean so yeah that's that's definitely something that we're excited by and we're watching the permitting and and how that's moving along too great, great. um other questions yes i'm just curious if in your research um if you're introducing deep nutrients into the surface ocean where but they may be stripped down by life. What is to stop, say, like a massive eutrophication or phytoplankton bloom right in the middle of your seaweed farm? Yeah, so that's definitely a major concern for us. And I know that artificial upwelling technology is fairly new and is a big kind of uh, concern overall. Um, that's why our technology kind of utilizes the, like I said, the drip irrigation from like um, regular farming. Um, that would ideally for us would allow the seaweed to kind of take up those nutrients before a bloom is really allowed to fully occur. Um, that, of course, needs more research on our part. So we don't have a yes or no yet, but that's something we're looking into. Great. Can I have time for one more question? Yes. I don't know how you guys got started, but what interests you about getting into CE? I mean, it's going to work on the farm, but it's just great to hear your story. Yeah. Um, well, my mom's a botanist, so she's been kind of throwing me in, like toward plants a lot of my life. Um, and then growing up in California, I was just kind of mesmerized by how beautiful seaweed is. Um, and then in my studies, learned about the potential it has to help our environment and help human health too, um, if we add it into our diets. And then, yeah, working on a seaweed farm really, really keyed me into um, how we need more connection between academia and industry. Um, it's it's a really emerging industry and we need a lot of like engineering support to help it grow. Um, so that's that's what got me into this. Pretty much a similar story to Natalie. Like a lot of other marine biology majors, I came into Scripps and I was super stoked about coral and stuff like that. I feel like people are really interested in coral. But from there, I was reading a lot of literature and I was seeing a lot based on aquaculture, seaweed, algae. Um, and I kind of saw it as an opportunity to jump into something that isn't as studied in our field um, and also could use a lot of technology as the current industry is kind of kind of not very technology based. So I saw an opportunity there. And then like Natalie, I'm really into plants. I love botany. Um, everyone on the team here probably knows from my Zooms that I have a ton of plants. Um, so yeah, just growing things in general. Great, thanks you guys. <laughs> All right, well, thank you guys. And to wrap us up, we've got Sushil Tiagi, who's always going to upstage everyone <laughs> with Berkeley Marine. Hi. Hi, how are you? Good afternoon. My name is Sushil Tiagi. Um, I'm here with Berkeley Marine Robotics, and this is going to be tale as old as the time of Vikings, but also as modern as our universal wish to see freaking laser beams on the heads of freaking sharks. But really, this is, for me, this is a culmination of something I feel like I've been working towards almost all my life. Starting in a village in India, I was fascinated by the idea of oceans. I would read about the beauty of it, the brutality, supposedly very hard math that was supposed to be involved. So when I showed up, at UC Berkeley in the ocean engineering department to do my grad school, I had actually never seen the ocean. And undeterred, I went on to get multiple degrees in naval architecture, in marine physics, in offshore structures. My thesis was in how to build floating offshore platforms, both for civilian and for military use. With all that, I come into the market and there was nothing going on in the ocean industry. There was nothing except oil and gas, the only job I could get was to become a test rider for Kawasaki. And this is in a pool in Palo Alto in a lab 
where I was examining the hulls of the tiny hulls of jet skis for performance improvement. That's like the best thing I could get. Obviously, things were so bad that the ocean engineering department at Berkeley was shut down. So I went to business school. After Wharton, I worked in corporate finance, competitive strategy around the world and global corporations making venture investment decisions. At the same time, volunteering in the state military and with the Coast Guard on cyber defense and in emergency response. With all that, I kept going back to Berkeley to say, what are the things I can help move forward? Could there be something? And that's where I meet a team that was doing the coolest thing. We had Alexander Emmers, a PhD in underwater robotics. They were working on how you can have a swarm of underwater robots that are communicating through lasers and could immediately see and inspect something in real time at fast scale. On top of that, we had multiple PhDs working in optics, involved people in machine learning. And of course, we got great mentors here from Start Blue. We have ex-Admiral Navy, head of the unmanned program, John Nagley. We have Jim Harvey, who is the chief of innovation for Navy SEALs. We had a uh, VC in, uh, in uh, Celine Schultz, who is working in Europe, working on Blue Ventures. With all the help, we said, what could this swarm do? There's so many possibilities. It could look underneath, could do inspections of ships. It could look under wind power platforms. It could look for ports. It could look for aquaculture. It could be examining what's going on around Navy fleet. So many uses. But where could we go for an immediate opportunity? Where is there is an immediate need? And we come to the ancient problem called biofouling. Now, biofouling has been around for a long time. I think since the Phoenicians sailed the sea for thousands of years, ship goes into the water, things grow at the bottom of it, it gets a little slow. Now in the old days, if the Vikings arrived a little too late for their pillaging or you know, berserking appointment, uh, it didn't matter. But now when a modern ship has to bring these important goods and food on time, they have to crank the gas. And even a small amount of biofouling after a certain point leads to tens of billions in fuel uses, as well as hundreds of millions of tons in CO2 emissions, simply because the biofouling is just unmanaged. Now, on top of it, you have invasive species coming into sensitive ports. Now, wouldn't this be a great idea to simply not have biofouling? But the idea is that's not that easy. Part of the problem is these big ships, they have to know exactly how the hull is doing, because if you hold up a ship for no reason, it, the delay can cost a lot more than the fuel savings. On top of it, many of the ports won't allow you to clean there because the poisonous coating matters. So you have to have real data to know when and where to clean and optimize your maintenance. That is not doable because nobody knows what's really going on under the hull. Only thing we have is divers can go down there once a year, twice a year, take a video for multiple number of hours, make the subjective narration of what they are seeing, then somebody else has to go out there and watch this video for a number of hours to make a subjective decision of what to do next by the time the ship is long gone. Nobody cares. So as a result, this waste continues. We have billions and billions in fuel and emissions continue because there is no data. Industry said to us, if there was a way, you could scan a ship every time it came into the port. Just scan it, if it only took a few minutes. And that data could then be tracked and we could now make a predictive movement as to when will be the right time and right place and what port will allow it when to do the cleaning. Now you can optimize everything. For that one, top of it is once you've collected the data, you can process it a lot faster because in modern days you can have an edge computation by machine learning model that can spot the invasive species in this video immediately. Nobody has to look through the entire video. You can look for corrosion, any damage. The key part of this technology is the ultimate holy grail of ocean science, which is an underwater laser. The reason is that because to swarm to operate underwater, there is no Wi-Fi, there is no GPS. So for swarm to know where it is and to maintain its position related to each other, it has to communicate. That communication and being able to transfer video for this kind of a data, you require a high bandwidth optic solution. And that is why we have this laser system that will enable that swarm. The need for this data as carbon penalties will come, as invasive species regulations will come, the data need will increase for every ship to be able to provide what's going on with their hull. 
as well as this, the reports have said 10 to 15%, you can reduce in fuel and emissions if you just have data to manage the hull better. And that could be 100 million tons reduced immediately simply by having better data. The traction we are having is we have letters of support from companies like Chevron uh, on shipping side. We have Hempel, the companies that are trying to find out how their coating is doing. They're all serving. We have filed our patents. We have accelerator investments coming from Sea Ahead as well from uh, Washington Maritime Blue and of course Scripps here. At the same time, support from California Land Commission because they would like to see this kind of data continually coming. And at the same time, now we have ports. We've started to field testing. And now we have a Coast Guard. They are saying, well, this will be nice, not only invasive species, but we'll like to see if there's a contraband or something attached to the ship. If you're scanning it anyway, do it. And we are going ahead with doing testing on the dual use side of it with Navy who are more interested in any kind of anomaly or spy or a detection device that get attached to the Navy ship besides the predictive maintenance of the ships. The two things essentially we are working on is finishing some of the pieces of the prototype, which are the laser com, the biggest part of it and the model underneath. And for that, we have some funding. For the pilot project is what we are looking for the right partner so we can have a proper field testing going on in partnership with a good port for, you know, whether it's in San Diego and with discussion with Rotterdam and with shipping companies and diving companies working together and get it there. I really feel that this is a project that I think I set out to do a long time ago. And now this is the kind of project I feel like here you are, you're helping improve the environment, protect biodiversity, and in fact, increase safety and security for our nation. Thank you. Thank you. Questions? I got, I got my hand. Yeah. Take it off. So I, I noticed uh, you you have a number of programs that you've been associated with, including Sea Ahead and um, Maritime mm -hmm. Blue, right? Well, Port Excel on there. Mm -hmm. How do, you, how do you compare your experiences in those various? Oh, absolutely. Yes. Yeah, no, so, no, that's great. Really, what it is that each of these accelerators bring a different layer of help for a project that has this many arms. Because what we have is not only technologically, we are dealing with autonomy, SWARM, laser comm. On business side, we're looking with civilian business, defense business, regulatory business. Different pieces are brought different things. See ahead, they were mostly getting into the impact aspect of it. What is really the CO2 emission reduction this kind of a data will do? Doesn't so much matter the revenue model side, which we can work out when we're working with the NSF on the uh, SBI grant. They were more interested in trying to find out where the revenue model is and how much will the ship pay for this kind of a data. Similarly here, the most important piece for us was the dual use because we knew that every time we brought this up to somebody, people said, oh yeah, the ship and biofouling is great, but wouldn't the Navy really, you know? So it was always the, the, the you know, find out what the Navy would want. So it was very important for us to have mentors like, you know, Admiral Nigley, who can really say what will the defense side of it look like? What is the scope of it? It should not become something that distracts you from your goal. A startup a venture has to be focused. What are you really working on? So what we can say is, yes, we are going to do this. And yes, that can be used by the defense market, but we're not going to go out there, try to do something that lands on a moon of Europa and start to do something else. This is not where to go. So each one does its own thing. And same thing at Washington Maritime Blue, what's happening there is that we have a Navy unit up there. And at the same time, they're providing some testing facility at the port. So different pieces bring in different value to it. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, absolutely. So the that's easiest piece of it and well-known piece of it is just the simple autonomy, which is to say that something tracks along a hull at a constant speed, at a constant distance. So therefore your standard data being fed, that's the easy part. Second part is the swarm part of it, that somehow they're holding their shape together. So it's like an MRI taking place over a hull and they're going together. So anyone gets left behind catches up because they're communicating with each other. The idea really is that underneath it, depending on the turbidity of the water, we believe you don't need any more than five units to be able to cover the catenary that needs to cover the ship shape. That will be about five. You can do it in about three. And as long as the laser is transmitting in within, let's say, 10, 15 feet, they're getting up to the other side of the data. One of the things we were dealing with here was that 
I had thought when I started this project that wouldn't the divers just shoot me on site? Like if I showed up at the port trying to do this, they'll say, this is your taking our livelihood away. And you know, irrespective of whether you're using, could they have been using one or two of these units in answer to your question? But when you start to bring the swarm, it starts to look like you're gonna automate the whole thing. Now, fun part of it is they are the ones who called us because then we hate this. We hate this inspection stuff because the reality is they have limited air time. In that, they would rather do the welding and the repairing that makes them the proper high margin work. This uses up all their time. So therefore, they kind of said to us, please automate this. This inspection bit is sort of like getting the estimate when you show up at the workshop. We would rather get called when there's an actual repair and cleaning to be done. If, if you can automate it and it's just part of our deal flow, high revenue, high margin. So what has happened as a result is we have a great alliance with them because they feel we are only going to increase their margins and their revenue as a result. Now, I don't have customer acquisition costs because they already have the customer that wants the scan. Secondly, I don't have the underlying capital expenditure costs because I'm not having to put up all the boats and everything because I'm riding my infrastructure riding on top of their infrastructure. So this has been actually a great help and to be able to see, but again, it's a matter of saying, how many used to be needed eventually that remains some of the pilot project because we'll have to just see how much data is good enough. Time for one more. Yeah. Does it only capture images of the side of the vessel or can it go under the vessel as well? Oh yes, so what the idea is that it's doing two things. That first, because there are actually niches under the ship, something called a sea chest, that's where a satellite unit even has to actually go in. And that's part of the reason important to note is this is not a, some kind of an autonomous system that goes away and you don't know. This is in real time control. It's just that you don't need a human being to be controlling it. It's essentially doing its thing, but it's being monitored. It's human in the loop. And, and similarly, our machine learning model is also human in the loop because the human has to be able to tell the model what it's seeing so that model over time learns. So, what we are doing really is that there can be a satellite unit that goes inside the sea chest, comes back out, and that data is being fed separately as opposed from the regular scan. But it is all the way around it. Now we'll have to see based on the business model that, look, we are promising within a few minutes. When Maersk talks to us, they're the big shipping company, their view was, if it happens within a few minutes, it's a great deal. You know? But at the same time, it starts to take hours and hours, then it's you know just like divers going in. So for us, question will be, do we know one time, then go second time, and that's 10 minutes, and that's too long, and five minutes if we get seven units in and does it? That's a bit of a business model discussion eventually in terms of efficiency, but but yes, it has to be done in one go. Excellent. Thank you, Sajil. Great, thank you. All right, thank you, Sushil, and thank you all to our everyone, all of our entrepreneurs and our startups. I'm really so impressed by the work that you've done. Thank you to our mentors, all the progress that you've all made tonight is just testament to all of that. So well done. I think everyone deserves a good round of applause. Thank you. Now for the drum roll. <laughs> if everyone wants to just scan this, you can vote for your favorite startup of the night, and we will be handing out a cash word, not actually here right now, but afterwards. <laughs> so I think, Jordan, are you here to help me with this? All right. Give you guys a couple minutes there. Anybody having problems with the app? <laughs> oh no, it's in what mode? Are we having, I think we're having technical difficulties. Yeah. Hmm. Can you disable the incognito mode? <laughs> We've got a whole room of technologists, but we can't figure out the app. We could just go old school and do applause or. <laughs> is anybody able to make it work oh okay good we got some takers all right so raise your hand if you've already voted oh okay so we're pretty good then all right do we have results then yeah
<laughs> it's like the, this, like the Oscars, and the audience choice award goes to drum roll, brrr, joy to the world. <laughs> My old school reference, Berkeley Marines. <laughs> Do you want to see? Do you want to make it <laughs> Okay. And with that, we can all break and break some food out there. Um, we just want to encourage everyone to sign up for updates. Applications will be open for cohort three coming this summer. So if you want, please scan, sign up for updates on our website if you're not already on our mailing list, and we will be sending all that out. And thank you again to everyone for being here tonight. I hope you enjoy the reception and get to know the entrepreneurs. And yep. Yeah, is the table so thank you thanks everyone on zoom